Hey, how's it going? Let's learn scripting in Reaper together. As some of you may know, we've been doing weekly live streams every Tuesday at 1.30 p.m. Eastern time with the wonderful Leandro Facchinetti. And Leandro has been kind enough to teach us how to code and answer any and all of our questions. But in addition to those live streams, every month I take everything I learned and try to condense them into one video for your viewing pleasure. And in every one of these episodes, I'll be giving you some challenges to test your newly acquired scripting chops. So in this episode, we're gonna reveal all the answers to the challenge from episode 2 so if you haven't watched those yet go and watch that the link will be up there as well as in the description and come back here when you're ready to have the answers revealed or if you don't want to do the challenges and just want to see the answers well I ain't judging but before we do that I also want to make a few corrections keep in mind that I'm not a scripting expert by any means I am a student just like you so I will invariably be making certain mistakes so let's clear those up first so the first correction is in regard to boolean arguments which we saw examples of in episode 2 in episode 2 I said that boolean arguments are kind of like yes or no questions which is true and it is a decent way of imagining them without getting too too technical however i said we answer yes to these questions by typing one and we say no to these questions by typing zero and that is not entirely recommend it. Now boolean arguments in a language like C are indeed answered by ones and zeros and as we saw last time when we did provide ones and zeros as boolean arguments they did work. However the correct syntax in Lua is actually to say true or false. So true being the equivalent of one and false being the equivalent to zero. So while using ones and zeros may sometimes work they are not guaranteed to and later on if you're using Lua in non-reaper applications you may also run into trouble if you respond to boolean arguments with ones and zeros. So it's just something that's good to get in the habit of doing and that's my bad if I helped you develop a wrong habit. The second correction is regarding global versus local variables. I briefly mentioned variables in the last tutorial though they're of course a topic that deserved their own tutorial and I said that global variables communicate across different scripts while local variables are exclusive to the scripts that they are in. This is just flat out incorrect again my bad on that one but local variables are local to functions inside our scripts that we define and may later recall them. Once again this is something that we haven't fully covered yet though we have seen examples of functions in our live streams but to make a really complex story short global variables run in the entirety of your script whereas local variables can be exclusive to a certain subsection of the code in your script this may not make sense right now until we know more about what functions are but like i said in the last episode it's a good habit for now to define every variable as a local variable just so we are safe and we will see examples of when it's appropriate to use global variables as well as how to make different scripts communicate with each other Let's get into Reaper and solve our challenges. Okay, so here's Dave, which you may remember from episode two. It simply gets our current cursor position, and then we can set a value here to move it by. So right now that value is one. So every time I run Dave, our edit cursor goes forward by one second, as you can see right here. And we also showed that this function gets our current cursor position in seconds. So our second challenge was to see if we can move the edit cursor position by time selection length. And this is what I came up with. So I found this function called reaper get set loop time range. And this will get the start time and end time of your loop points, which for me at least is linked to my time selection. And as you can see, it has five arguments. So the first argument is is set, i.e. do you want this to set your loop range, which in our case is false because we want to just get that information. The next one is is loop, which we set true to. Then it says the number start and number end and these two as far as I can tell are only applicable if this first boolean argument is true otherwise they will have no effect on the script. These will just be numbers in seconds that you would set your time selection to but in this case we're not setting the time selection. And finally the last question is allow auto seek and again that will be applicable if we were changing the time selection which we're not so we answered false to that. And this function will return to us a number start and a number end. So I think this is the first time we're seeing a function that returns two things to us and when that is the case and we are defining these returns as variables we separate them by a comma so the first thing this function is returning is number start which i'm defining as a local variable called time cell underscore start the next return of this function is the number end which i'm defining as time cell underscore end then i'm defining another local variable called time cell underscore length which is simply the end value minus the start value and that'll give us a duration of our time 
selection. So I'm just going to put my edit cursor somewhere kind of random and I'm going to set a random time selection and we can see the values of our time selection right here. And I have all these three things that the functions are returning to us set to be printed to the console. So let's run the script now. As we can see, our cursor position is at 1.609. Our time selection starts at 2.24, ends at 4.84. So all of that seems to be in order. So now simply by running reaper.setEditCurPause, we can move our edit cursor by time selection. So current cursor position plus time selection length. And right now, as we can see, it's moving by 2.6 seconds every time. And if I change the length of my time selection to something bigger and I run the script, it is going forward by a much bigger value. The practical uses for this may be limited, but the point was for us to figure this out, which I think this is a fine solution. So our first challenge was to see if we can move the edit cursor position by a measure. So if you remember from last time, get cursor position always returns to us a value in seconds. So it wasn't minutes and seconds or it's not time code or it's not bars and beats. And for example, if you want to get this in minutes and seconds, there's an easy way of doing that. Well, we can divide by 60 to get the minutes. And if we do that right now, you can see that we are at 1 minute 48 seconds. But what we received was 108 from our cursor position. That's 60 seconds plus 48 seconds. And then when we divided by 60, we got 1.8. Well, we want to know the number of minutes, but we don't want that decimal value. So there's a simple math function in Lua that can help us get that. And that function is called math.floor. So if we take any number with decimals and put it through this function, what it will return to us is just that number without the decimal. And functions that aren't called reaper.something, you can't get their information from the Reaper API. You have to actually go to the Lua built-in API, which I'll include the link to that in the description. And once we run the script now, we can see that it's just giving us the minute. So that gives us the minute and that's cool. And to get the seconds, we are using another mathematical operator called modulo. So modulo basically divides two numbers, but instead of returning the result of that division, it will return to us its remainder. So as an example, if I put 66 modulo 60 here, what do you expect us to get in return? Well, let's print that and see. We get six because that is the remainder after we divide 66 by 60. So now if we run this action, we can see that we are getting the minutes from this local variable called CCP underscore minutes, and we are getting the seconds from this second local variable called CCP underscore seconds. And just to show you another thing you can do, if you want to add two values together and show them as a string, you can use dot dot. So I can put something like this here, now this will reveal to us exactly what we see up here. 2 minutes, 19 seconds, and 6, 8, 1, blah, blah, blah. So that's how you get minutes and seconds. And now let's get to the actual point of this challenge, which was to see how we can move the edit cursor by a measure value. So I'm going to set the ruler to measures and beats, and I'm going to change this to measures and beats as well. And right now I'm on measure 5710. So basically, if you want to move the edit cursor by measures, we'll need to define what a measure is. And to do that, here's another function that's good to know. Reaper.timemap underscore get divided BP at time. As you can see, this will return to us a number and that number will be our BPM at the current cursor position as we have put in here. And we also need to get the time signature of our project. This function time map underscore get time sig at time will get us that. And we can see right here in the documentation of the Reaper API that this will return the number of the time signature. It will give us the denominator. So is it six, eight or is it four, four? And it actually gets us the tempo as well. So we didn't really need that last function. Here's something Thing I just learned while shooting this video as well. But basically, since we have the BPM, all we need is that first number up top because whether we're in 4, 4 or 6, 8, it doesn't matter. Our tempo is set to beats per minute. So if the value of our beats is a quarter note, as in every time signature with the denominator as 4, or if our beat is defined as an eighth, like in 6, 8 or 9, 8 or 5, 8 or 3, 8, then again, the value of the beat is defined in eighths. So we only need the top number for that. As we all know, zero means the active project and it needs a number in time, which we are getting from our get cursor position. So to calculate the duration of a measure in seconds is very easy. It is 60 divided by whatever the BPM is. That will get us the duration of one beat in any time signature. The number of beats in that time signature is dictated by the top number in the time signature. So that gives us the duration of one measure. So for example, if our BPM is 120 and our time signature is 44, then the duration of one measure is 60 divided by 120 and that's 0.5 times 4 
that's two seconds. And as always, we will then plug these into set edit cur pause, and this will move the current cursor position by measure duration. And as we just learned, it's best to say true and false to these, so I'll also modify that. And now let's run the script. And every time we do, we are now going forward by one measure. And even if we run into some different time signatures, it doesn't matter. It will always get the value at that position, and then it will work by moving forward. Now we're at three eight and it's still going forward by one measure. And having a script like this is nice because we can always rely on this script to go forward by one measure. But when it comes to odd time signatures, sometimes there's no way of doing that by grid size. So right now my grid size is set to whole notes. So if I move my edit cursor forward right now when I'm in a 3 8 measure, you can see that sometimes we are falling off the grid because a whole note is like 8 eighths, and in a 3 8 measure there's only 3 eighths to speak of. Even if I come and set my grid size to say a quarter note, we still got a problem. Sometimes it it'll be on grid and sometimes it'll be off grid. So I need to actually come and set my grid size to a dotted quarter note, which is not super convenient. And what if in the next measure we go to seven eighth and now I got to change it again. Now, of course, in Reaper natively, we also have these functions, moving edit cursor back one measure and moving edit cursor forward one measure. So these don't care at all. They will move forward one measure regardless of what the time signature is. So that means that we didn't really need to do any of that, right? Another thing I can do, even if I want to use this in a script, is to simply right click on it and copy its selected command ID, and I can paste it here. And here's another great function to know about, main on command, and as its argument, it takes a command ID, which we just put in here. And then there's a flag, which I don't exactly understand what it is, but it's always zero in every script that I've seen. This main on command can run inside the script any action we find in the main section of our action list. And of course, if we want to use other sections, there's also, for example, the MIDI editor on command, which will run any action in the MIDI editor. So we can basically also erase all of this stuff and just run this. But since we did all this work, let's put it to use. And I can think of one thing we can do that Reaper can't do natively. There is no way to natively move edit cursor forward or backwards by a measure using your mouse wheel or CC messages. So for example, imagine if you have a MIDI controller with a jog wheel, what if we can write a script to move our edit cursor by moving the jog wheel? And that is possible. And I actually just made this action and I called it Steve Buscemi for now. And let's go over Steve Buscemi. So first of all, I wasn't exactly sure how to utilize the mouse wheel. I looked in the function list and I didn't find any fun functions that had a very obvious name. So what I did was I just ran a search called mouse wheel and I looked at some of the custom actions that we have. And for example, we have the good old MPL who has a mouse wheel action to zoom horizontally and change the grid relatively. So I knew that whatever the mouse wheel function is, it'll be somewhere in MPL's script. And sure enough, I saw this action here, get action context. And it's saying something like if mouse scroll, blah, blah, blah. So I was like, this must be it. So I looked this up and there's this get action context and it says returns contextual information about the script, typically MIDI slash OSC input values. Well, perfect. And as we can see, this function takes in no argument, but it returns to us a bunch of stuff, whether there's a new value, what the file name is. It also gives us a command ID. It also gives us the mode, the resolution and the value. So this function returns a bunch of stuff to us. And as you can see right here, MPL has defined every return that he doesn't need by just an underscore. All he needs is the last return, which as we saw right here is the value. So I was like, all right. And I copied all of this stuff into Steve Buscemi. So I just set Steve Buscemi to basically print what this value is so I can see what I can do with it. And I assign Steve Buscemi to option control and mouse wheel. So now whatever our function pumps out, it'll be printed on the Rea script console. So as I'm moving my mouse wheel down, I am getting all negative values on here. And I think it's based on my speed, but I'm not sure. And as I move it up, we can see that I'm getting positive values here. And if I set this to any CC lane, it'll be the same. I'll get positive values when I move clockwise and I'll get negative values when I move counterclockwise. So that's perfect. And I did a bunch of other testing and I came up with this function that can move our edit cursor based on our mouse wheel. So let's first see it in action. I got my edit cursor here. It's moving forward by one measure and now it's moving back by one measure. And if at any point we get to any different time signature, it doesn't matter, it will still work and it will still move. And Bob is our uncle. And this is actually a useful functional script that to my knowledge, nobody else has written. So there we go. We just did something useful for the community. Hey. So let's look at it in a little bit more detail and then we'll call it a day for today. So the first thing 
thing this does is gets our cursor position and then after that some conditional things are happening based on whatever this mouse scroll value is. And as we said when I move my mouse wheel back this value will be negative so it'll be smaller than zero. Then this bit of code will run otherwise it'll be a positive value and this little bit of code will run. And the bit of code that's running inside is the same as we saw before. We are getting the BPM, we are getting the time selection. From that, we are calculating the duration of a measure and we are moving the edit cursor position by the current position minus the duration of a measure when our mouse wheel is going back or plus the measure duration when our mouse wheel is going forward. Now, I could have also done all of these calculations outside the conditionals, but I saw that something interesting happens when I do this normally. But basically, the script is totally functional right now. It's moving forward by one measure or backward by one measure. However, something interesting happens when you get right on the edge of two time signature markers. So for example, right now, if I hit my hotkey and go back, normally what would happen is that it would get the current BPM and time signature right here from this measure where it's 3.8. And then when I would move back, instead of going back to the previous measure, it would just go back 3.8. Then from there, it would realize, oh, now I'm in 6.8. And then it would begin to go back by the duration of one measure, but it would still always be 1.3 eighths off from the top of the measure if that makes sense. So the way I tackled that is that I said when we are going backwards, instead of getting the cursor position from the current position of the cursor, just go back a hundredth of a second so that you'll fall somewhere in the previous measure. So then you will be getting the current BPM and current time signature, not from the measure that you are on, but from the previous measure, which contains the time signature and tempo markers from the previous measure. And once I did that, then the script was working. So let's close this. If we move back wherever we are, it's always going back by one measure as you see up here. And if we get into a new time signature, it's not affected by it at all, which is super cool. And I'm using my mouse wheel to control this, which is something that natively doesn't exist in Reaper. And if we want, we can further simplify this by just putting these actions in. So I can just copy this action command ID and I can strip all of this and I will just go Reaper main on command like this. And I'm going to copy the forward by one measure and I can erase all this code and do reaper main on command. And I can save this and if I close it, it's still working. So yay, we don't need to do any of that math for Steve Buscemi. It could be as simple as this. But once again, it was something kind of fun to try and figure out for me. And let me know in the comments if you were able to figure this out. Let me know if you found a better way than mine. Maybe I'm just totally dumb and there's a total better way to do this. So let me know all of that. Let me know how difficult these challenges were. And we'll have more of these in the future. And stay tuned because in the next episode, we will go over if statements and else if statements and all of that in more detail. We will talk about functions and we will talk talk about this little function called defer as well. So all in due time for now, these were the answers to the challenges. So there you have it. And one last thing before I go, making these scripting tutorials takes me a really long time. On the other hand, it seems like they are just not popular enough. So while I was initially intending on doing one of these every month, I am now going to do a new episode every time the last episode reaches at least 555 views. I am not doing these for views, but I just don't want to get too, too ahead of people People learning with me. The whole point of this is for us to learn together. So if the interest is already fading in this series, then I will just stop making it. Of course, the live streams will keep going, but if nobody's interested in any of these, this series will get discontinued like my audio tutorial tutorials got discontinued because nobody cared about them. So if you've been procrastinating or if you haven't been watching the videos or if you're saving them for later, well, now's the chance to do so. Episode two is currently sitting at 277 views, so it needs about twice that before the next next episode comes out. As soon as it hits 555, I will start making the next episode. So we will continue to do our streams, but this series will continue based on demand or maybe not. And I hope that sounds fair enough to all of you. Take care of yourselves and on your screen, you will see the link to the playlist for this series where you can go and watch episode two and the previous episodes if you haven't. And of course, please support Leandro by subscribing to his channel. Take care of yourselves and I'll see you soon. Bye.